Will Snackers, Kareem Iskander here, Lead Technical Advocate with Cisco Learning and Certifications. Hey everyone, I'm Matt DiNapoli. I'm a Manager of Developer Advocacy with Cisco Developer Relations. Welcome to Episode 103 of Snack Minute. Snack Minute is your weekly bite of coding, tech, and just some cool stuff that we think you might like to know. And I think we're going to talk about a really cool topic today with a returning guest. You must have seen her hanging out with us at Cisco Live. Annie, Annie, do you mind introducing yourself? Yeah, I'm happy to. My name is Annie Hardy. I am Cisco Senior Visioneer. I'm a futurist. It's kind of, that's my gig. That's what I get It's such a cool title. <laughs> it, it, it really is. Super fun. fun. Yeah. Um, speaking of futurist, uh, you're starting to put out a, I'm going to call it a, a treatise or a treatise. Treatise? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like <laughs> um, of the future of work and the future mainly of workers. Yeah. Um, can you give us kind of a rundown of the main themes that you address within that? Yeah, so I think what's interesting at Cisco is that we, we you hear a lot from Cisco about the future of work and the future of hybrid work and the future of collaboration. And that's absolutely what we're going to be seeing. But there's like a, a few things that are clicks down from that that are about the future of workers and how the nature of work is going to change. And so I wrote a paper um, and it really touches on some of those topics. It touches on the impact of some technologies and how um, how the work is going to change. And it talks about some of the changes in demography and demographics and, and what the impact of that is going to be. So it's it's going to be an interesting one. I should be launching it within the next, like Mar- May-ish. Uh, we should be able to have that available. That's an interesting um, way to kind of look at the way that we shift work and, and everything we're doing. Because when we talk about the future of work or the future engagements with the office, we always think about how do we collaborate better? What are the web tools that we're using to, to talk about these things? So it's exciting to kind of take break that common paradigm of conversation mm-hmm. and really kind of dig into, well, how does it affect the individual? How does some of these tools make our jobs easier? How do these some of these tools, tools make our jobs harder? Mm-hmm. Um, and what do we have to think about? Because sometimes we just dive in feed first into some of these things right. and not really think about the ramifications of adopting things like chat GPT or, mm-hmm. or, you know, you know, how does that fit into the, the future of work and what we're doing here? So I, I read a statistic recently that uh, I think over 80% of Generation Z is choosing the employer that they want to work with based on their sustainability metrics. Oh, oh that's wow. interesting. <laughs> right? Not, yeah. Not you salary. never would have. Not salary. Well, salary has an impact. Mm. But what we're seeing is that with younger and demographics and Gen Z is very different uh, than previous generations, but we've we've moved away from um, the concept of blind loyalty. Uh, in the what, what's happened is you have a, a different a different relationship between workers and employers, and so when we talk about trust, um, trust in the future of work is going to be multifaceted. We have the employee wants to be able to trust the employer, or the worker trusting the employer, but then we also have um, have customers wanting to trust the company and we have partners wanting to trust the company but then working with other partners and this co-opetition and the ecosystem of all these companies working together and how do they do it so if we look back at 2008 uh blockchain was created Mm -hmm. and we look at bitcoin launched in 2009 so bitcoin is a decentralized currency uh blockchain is part of the decentralized web and decentralization is addressing the problem of trust so the reason we decentralize is because we do not trust the reason. I mean, I'm fine centralized. Some people don't want to centralize. <laughs> That's cool. I'm just, I work at Cisco. Let's be honest, okay? So anyway, we're like, the reason people wanted to pull apart centralization, there are a lot of reasons behind it. But a big reason is they don't trust that centralization is going to work. So when we look at the way that is reflected in the workforce, mm-hmm. this is a mentality that is happening with people not trusting centralization, people not trusting companies, people choosing um, the ethical, uh, having ethical expectations of an employer right. that they've never had before. Like this is this is novel. And so we called it the trust imperative. So what happens is that companies who succeed are going to have to focus on how they can engender trust, not just for now and not just for their workers, but also for all of their all of their customers, what their brand looks like, it's going to be prolific. And their ethical considerations uh, are part of it. Their um, ESG is part of it. So you're gonna see a lot of really interesting, you're gonna see a rise in like the trust officer. 
um, as opposed to just having somebody who's in data and analytics. It's going to shift. The focus isn't just going to shift um, towards intelligence or insights um, or automation. It's going to be about trusted interactions and trustworthy companies. What are the expectations for people that are employed in a global perspective, work mobily, and you know, teams, um, Kareem and I both work for teams that are distributed. Right. Yeah. And so how does, how, do, how does that trust model kind of fit into those people that are coming up and being able to say, well, um, you know, I'm, I, I'm making sure that my company's doing the right thing. I'm doing the right thing for my company. You know, where, where's the dividing line? Cause I mean, we're, we kind of navigate it right now, but it's cause we, been doing it for a long time, but yeah. it's not always that case for people. It's very decentralized. <laughs> hey, um, I think it's interesting because um, when we talk about distributed talent, and we talk, this is where hybrid work comes back in. I know we said we were talking about the feature workers, but <laughs> right. back into hybrid work. Because what's interesting about hybrid work is that companies um, have, I don't think in the history of work, have they ever had as much opportunity to see the digital signals and have the observability capacity to be able to see what's happening online. Um, observability is a part of us being able to deliver a trusted experience. So you're actually delivering on what you say, but it's also being able to be aware of what's happening. Um, because when you have distributed teams and when you have, you know, products and everything's in the cloud, um, it just creates a different environment of how can you, how can you, trust what's happening? How can you have insight into what's happening? How can you observe it? Um, so part of that, part of the equation is we have more digital signals that are available right. for people to actually use. What's interesting is that what are the ethics behind how companies use them? That was going to be the next question. Yeah. <laughs> because, so for instance, in WebEx, what I love about WebEx is they have the insight section. Like if you go and click yeah. on personal insight, you have to turn, if you have WebEx, you have to turn it on and it takes like a couple weeks and then you can like see who you're connected to and see if you're time blocking. And it, it does actually change my behavior. Um, but what happens is that's my personal information. This is a future that's, that's challenging, but the fact is that employers have this data. The question isn't whether they're going to have it. The question is what they do with it. And increasingly, employees and the market and people are going to want to trust a company that is trustworthy. What has happened to Meta legally? What has happened to Google legally? Right. Um, there have been huge lawsuits. And so I think the idea is companies have to seriously consider how they show that they are trustworthy and how they show that they have been trusted and how, what, how that makes a difference to workers and customers as well. Okay, right, let's go back to future of work. Okay. We were talking about trust and trust goes both ways, mm -hmm. right? And so what's the, and we hear this, we hear about this all the time. Um, and this is, I want to bring back, bring us back to artificial intelligence and AI. Okay. So where does that um, fall in the future of work and how do you envision AI impact work? You know, what's really interesting about AI, everything. Um, you know what else is interesting about AI? Honestly. Oh, we're done here. I guess, I guess go. No, what's really interesting about AI is that um, there's a tremendous amount. It's like bifurcated, right? People are either super stoked or they're like terrified. Right. There, is, there is very few like between. And what's interesting about that is companies are trying to control the chaos, but they don't. If you don't understand AI and you don't understand the potential, and then you can't really understand the risk and address it. So I think a lot of companies are looking at AI, especially now with generative AI. Um, historically, over the past like five years, 10 years, people who are using AI were data scientists and yep. you use so R, SPSS, it's machine learning, it's machine learning right. right? But what, what generative AI has done is, is the tools and the reinforcement learning and the conversational interfaces have democratized um, artificial intelligence. So now what happens is you don't have to go and understand everything that comes behind it. You don't have to understand um, the ethics of responsible right. AI. You don't have a background mm -hmm. in this to be able to understand. It's not difficult anymore. And so what happens is the barrier is lower. So more people can use it and thus more people can abuse it. This is low code, no code. This is what we saw 10 years ago when people started talking about low, low code, no code. Right. right now, generative AI, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. It's just another low code, no code. But what happens is that it's definitely going to impact the future of work. And I gave an internal, had an internal conversation about yesterday where I said, I don't believe 
that AI is going to replace all the workers. I do believe that, a, that workers with AI will replace workers who don't have AI. Mm-hmm. And so when I talk to people about the impact on the future of work and what they need to do, I talked to somebody about this today. She reached out to me. She's a graphic designer. And she was like, I'm a designer and everybody in my, you know, everybody in my community is kind of freaked out about this. I'm also an artist. We have people who have lost jobs because of it. We have people who are, you know, doing AI art. And I said, okay, so what's your new tool stack? Mm-hmm. What's your new tool stack? What are you going to learn? Right. Because in the future of work, automation has been happening. The low code movement was, was going, or the no code movement was found to occur. So now we as workers have to reconsider our relationship to work and the nature of the work that we're going to do so that we have sustainable careers. You can't, you won't be able in, in many cases, you will not be able in three years to do work like you've done it because there will be some other way that you can do it that's more efficient. And if you're you're more efficient, then you have a better chance of actually having a job and, and building a long lasting career. You wanna be at the front of this. So you need to look into the new generative AI tool stack. You need to submit an infosec request to make sure <laughs> it is actually approved. Make sure you're using it responsibly. Make sure the data that you're using is available for use. All of those things, which our employees do as well. Uh, but start the process of considering what your new stack is going to be, and then you can start making a plan to build it. Do you see parallels in the potential adoption of uh, generative tools, um, you know, potentially what we would call AI uh, tool chains uh, or tool sets, similar to the adoption of PCs in like the 70s and 80s? Or, yeah. or is, it even, is it something that could, we could adapt even faster? I think it's like Microsoft Word. I think generative AI is Microsoft Word and PowerPoint. I think it is um, Adobe, like Photoshop. Anybody who's been in creative roles, uh, introducing Microsoft Word, all of a sudden you could edit things Mm -hmm. and it made things drastically simpler. I think it's like that. I think, and everybody uses Microsoft Word now. Um, I can sit from, from a diffusion model perspective. So you've got large language models and diffusion models. You can generate, some of them generate text, some generate designs or code or images or videos or models. So those are all kinds of outcomes that can be generated by generative AI. That's why it's called generative AI, generate stuff. Um, but effectively, when we're looking at this, diffusion models, I think those are like the Adobe InDesign. So if you think of graphic designer tools that were introduced 20, 30 years ago, whatever, this is like that. And if you're a graphic designer and you don't know generative AI, you have a, there's a potential you'll lose out, just like a painter would have lost out if they weren't able to do graphic design because they didn't know the tools. Right. This is what I think it is. And the challenge is that upskilling is actually complicated. I also think that part of the complexity here is that entry-level jobs, like as we're looking at this and the future of work is going to be impacted, entry-level jobs aren't all going to be for 22-year-old college graduates. Mm-hmm. We're going to have to upskill and reskill and change, and we're going to have 55-year-old entry-level workers. And so we as a culture have to remember that with the introduction of AI, yeah. we're going to have to make sure that bias is like set aside in these processes. We're going to have to redefine in our heads what that looks like. You know, Annie, I, I hate interrupting you. It's We could talk about this forever. Mm-hmm. It's very <laughs> fascinating. Um, I'd like to give Snackers a chance to learn more about what you're, what you're talking to us here. Um, Give us a little bit of what to expect at Cisco Live. I know some some of the folks Cisco Live is coming up, so uh, some of our snackers might be there. Um, let us know what you're doing there. I would love to see all the snackers. I've got some tricks up my sleeve that we haven't confirmed yet, so just just know that there will be fun things. But I do have two breakouts. Yeah, I know. We'll we'll see. I'm still working on it, but we have two breakouts definitely. One is about generative AI. So I talked a little about this, and it's going to be completely focused on the journey that we're taking because we're not finished with this journey, but I I want to talk to our customers who are controlling the chaos of generative AI AI, or who are trying to, so we can talk with them about our journey to practice responsible AI in a way that lives up to the Cisco name, because we are, I think we're the most trusted B2B brand in the country or in the world, and we're not gonna do anything to harm that. We we want to do it securely. So that's gonna be really interesting uh, discussion. The other one is about the metaverse. So the last time we mm-hmm. talked, right, right. this would be a continuation of that. I wasn't there. Yeah, you were. <laughs> it. You were doing important things. Yes. Um, but the last time we talked was about uh, the metaverse and what it is and where we fit into that. So I'm going to go a couple of clicks deeper on the metaverse and the spatial web, which I talked about in episode 91 
which they may link to. But um, but those are going to be really interesting, right? Right here. Uh, those are going to be like this guy. He's going to link to it. He's like, I can't link to anything. I'm on camera. Links. Sorry. Links. <laughs> um, but I think those are going to be really vibrant, interesting conversations that um, are within the context of our emerging trends. So I'd love to see some snappers there. And come say hi. Tell me if you think you're like, hey, I'm the person that watched the thing. I'm like, I'm the person that was on the thing. <laughs> I would love to see you. If, they, if there is a brain to pick, it, 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 it. <laughs> but snackers, this is all the time we have for you today. Uh, and thank you so much. Yeah, it's always fun having you on and uh, we'll see you soon.